Yeah, they're out showing like mad and bream out long. And another one, like 400 yards. We had about 500 yards. Well, it's a bit special, this pit, to be honest with you. It's just shy of 200 acres. I think it's 187, 86, but in our furnace, it's pretty much 200 acres, especially with the water the way it is at the moment up. And I don't think that's including the nature reserve, which I think would actually put it over 200 acres when you had the nature reserve in. It's full of rumour and mystery local, it's steeps in it. And my dad, he started fishing it when I was much younger. He'd always wanted to fish it, but I would only been really young at the time. It's not the kind of place to get a kid into fishing. You just sat there looking at motionless rods, nothing really happening. Eventually, after years of fishing, other pits, the Manchester pit and a couple of other pits that I went on to fish, and obviously doing a bit on the day tickets and stuff, he finally managed to convince me, well, he tricked me, really. He said it was going to go somewhere else because he was spawning on my syndicates. So we said, like, I've booked you this place and we're going to go and fish there for the weekend and I rocked up and it was here and I remember just driving down you could only see one arm of it which I now know is only about 60 acres and I was in shock I just didn't really want to be here I wanted to go home I'd caught fish from up to about 80 90 acres by that point but I knew that this was just one arm and I'm looking at like a massive just expanse of water and I've not really liked fishing for other species mainly but my dad said come on let's just put them out for the bream because there's rumours of a big bream and it is known as like a big bream water. It's probably some of the best bream fishing in the Northwest, to be honest with you, if not in the whole country. That first night, he had an 18 pounder. And it, when I sat there and just watched that first sunset, when it went quiet and everyone had got home and he ended up watching that sunset over just over nearly a mile in length of water and the sun setting over it and the waves start going purple. I just knew straight away I needed to have a go on here. Yeah, it doesn't really matter if you catch. I think that's what you've got to get into. Yeah? Like when I started fishing here, I was 17. I wasn't a good angler. I'm still not a good angler now. And I'm fishing waters where even good anglers would struggle. But you've just got to get it into your head that even when you don't catch, you can still win. Like just look at that sun coming up there, for example. At the end of the day, I've won now, regardless of whether I catch one or not. The things I love most about fishing the big wild pits is probably just the sunrises, the sunsets. Um, not even so much the fishing itself, it's more just being out there, especially when you get them big wild winds and you feel just like so small, so little. When you get them big conditions and you know really it's a bit stupid to be there and you shouldn't really be there. You get the big winds coming in, got the rain driving in and at your face, it just kind of makes you feel alive and you just don't get that same buzz in them smaller waters personally. The biggest influence in my fishing has got to be my dad. I have always just been me and him since he was little and he's never really been one for fishing commercials. I think when he was younger he had done himself but just like natural progression he ended up going on to slightly bigger waters, slightly wilder waters and I didn't really have much of a choice so I kind of got forced to go with him and I'm kind of grateful of that now because if it wasn't for him I don't think I'd have been doing this style of fishing. I probably won't even be fishing at all to be honest. Well, there's not much known about the Carpenter, to be honest with you. Going back to, say, 20 years ago, there was one write-up on the internet on an old forum, which no longer exists, of one guy and his campaign on here. Now, from what I believe off memory, he'd struggled for three or four years, bouncing about, hadn't really caught a single... I don't think he'd caught anything, to be honest with you, in three or four years of fishing it. And he finally managed to find, I think it was a bloodworm bed, and he got something going, and he started catching quite consistently and he'd had a common of 32 and a smaller one and then a few other smaller fish. There wasn't really much known about the place, just like I said, steeped in local mystery and rumour. People say there's hundreds in here, some people say there's 80 pounders in here, which we all know there isn't. But going off the probably last four years I've fished it religiously, I must have clocked over three, four hundred nights on here. I met a lad on my first trip on here as well, he was fishing it, really nice lad. Become good mates of him, he'd stayed on for the last three years with us. Between us, and I fish it with my dad quite a lot still, so say I've done 400 nights, that's like you coming on doing 800 nights because there's two of us, two sets of eyes, two sets of rods. And then with our mates as well, we've done a hell of a lot of time between us. And if I had to guess, I'd guess somewhere around 35, 40 fish, no more than 50. And when you think you've got 200 acres of water and I reckon 60% of it is out of bounds. You are kind of up against it. You've got the old road that runs from here to 
to here and that sections off the start of the nature reserve um, and then obviously behind the nature reserve you've got this big open bay loads of channels different islands and different bits sticking out loads of back bays more channels more little lakes all interconnected and that's sectioned off by the old road but you actually can't fish from there down to there that's the first peg On that, after that first trip when I was fishing for the bream, I went for the walk and I bumped into a lad who have become good mates with now. Quite a cagey bloke at first, but obviously you would be. He'd been on it a few months and he'd actually managed to get into a few quite quickly. I got speaking to him and I kind of knew I needed to come back on and have a go after what he was telling me, the stories, and just that first sunset, I just fell in love with the place. We come back on the week later and we found him first trip down in the bay. Not many of them, as it was going dusk, it's coming out off the main body of water, probably 140 acres of just barren nothing. As it kind of flattened off, you'd always see these backs coming in. Like you could just see V's coming out, out just from this abyss, just coming into this small bay. And you'd come over an area, which we named Norman, and come out on like a point, and it was really kind of like harsh, gritty ground. Like you're almost ripping your way, it's just walking on it. You won't think that you'd drop down and be comfortable feeding on it. But you'd see them coming over this kind of shallow bar, this shallow point, coming out into this bay. Not many of them, probably two, three fish a night. So that's what we ended up focusing on. But straight away you realise just how much of a logistical bar lake it would be. With massive floating weed beds coming down, wiping you out. This bay would say be eight foot deep and it'd be four foot tall in weed. And then you'd have floating weed beds, which just started breaking up quite early on in the summer. But they'd be tailing five foot. So no matter what you did with your line, back leads, no back leads, you'd constantly be in harm's way because the weed was four foot high and you've got weed beds that's a trailing five foot deep which as they're coming along they'd pick your line up and they'd drag you out so you ended up fishing with sticks like a um, washing line method but out in the lake we'd go out in the boat 100 150 yards to the spot where we kept seeing them cut out to and then they'd vanish you'd come over and then they'd cut out in front of me and then they'd vanish so that's where we thought they'd be dropping down and feeding maybe so we'd went out there with big sticks with, like bees in stuck them in the ground so you'd be fishing like a washing line 150 yards out 100 yards out with a back lead right at the back of the stick and then your rig just behind the stick so you only had like two inches of line in the water but yet you were fishing 150 yards out in the pond and it's just stuff like that straight away you realise that it's above you and I've never done anything like it and you really start to think like I'm a bit out of my depth. So we kept baiting that spot, keeping an eye on that spot because a pattern emerged quite quickly and every night you'd see one, two, even three fish. Not many, but when you've been led to believe there could be anywhere from 20 to 200 fish in here. And even if you put 200 fish in 200 acres, that is still generally low stock. Then you throw 20 in the mix. That's like one in five acres. Um, if not, oh, one in 10 acres, sorry. That is like really, really, really low stock. And the fact that so much out of bounds, we found them quite quickly. We felt quite lucky or we thought there was more in here than what we was first led to believe. So we kept putting a bit of bait on this spot, trickling it in. And one trip, I said to my dad, I wanted to go a bit further up the bank and go around the other side of the point. So I'd left him and I'd gone around the other side of the point. And I rang him straight away. I waded out on the other side of that no man's land as far as I could and placing a couple of rigs in. I remember ringing him saying, it's like ridiculously warm. We had like a 40 mile an hour wind pushing in. You could hardly even stand up. But it'd be like a bath. Honestly, you didn't need the wadies. You could have just gone in for the bath. I never felt water so warm. Maybe with just the waves turning it over, lapping it in. It must have been 30 degrees, like scorching. It's a bit special, this pit, to be honest with you. Full of rumour and mystery local. It's steeped in it. If I had to guess, I'd guess somewhere around 35, 40 fish. No more than 50. And when you think you've got 200 acres of water, and I reckon 60% of it is out of bounds, you are kind of up against it. In that bit of marginal weed before me in the spot, I'd have turned up there's a couple of tails sat there. They're in the area. Rod just pulled around and my hand still on the clip. It's took me a second to realise what's going on. And then they're just getting stripped down the lake, stripped down the lake, stripped down the lake. One's bump on the spot. Then another on the spot. Then another on the spot. You've just got to get it into your head that even when you don't catch, you can still win. Like just look at that sun coming up there, for example. At the end of the day, I've won now, regardless of whether I catch one or not.